Welcome to Revitalize and Replant with Mark Clifton, where we equip pastors to take their churches from declining to thriving by pointing them to a new future and a new hope. Join us weekly for encouragement and practical advice in your pastoring journey. This is Revitalize and Replant with Mark Clifton. I'm Dan Hurst, and boy, today... We've got something to talk about. We do. We're going to talk about the unseen signs. Unseen signs, <laughs> Of he a says. declining or dying church. Now, we, you say, oh, well, I, that's pretty obvious, you know, no, when some of the things we not. talk about. But some of them will really kind of come up and get you. Right. <clears throat> so, I mean, the seen signs are, hey, Dan, how you doing? Yeah. You doing well? Yeah. Nice to yeah, see yeah, you. Just, just, hey, but the, the, the seen signs are um, uh, we're down in attendance, and we don't have as much money as we used to have. But there's a lot more behind the scenes that you don't see. Well, yeah, or 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 we just can't. Um, we don't have an evangelism pastor, right? Or we know. don't have a youth program. Or, yeah, that, there's so many things that we can yep. blame it on. Yep. But these are the unseen things, the little things there that that exist and are very real and uh, cause some real problems in the church. Along with us today, we have our friend. Uh, what's his name? Uh, hang on, just a minute. It's on my phone here. It should be on a list it's somewhere. A, it's somewhere. Who's who's the guest today? No, he was last week. It, it was Mark. Mark Halleck. Mark is yeah, Mark. Yeah, that's how me. You Thanks, Mark? guys. It's good to meet you. Glad I feel you're loved. Here. Thank you. For no, Mark Halleck has been our guest for like twenty episodes, right, or more than that. And we're Thanks grateful. For not kicking me out yet. I we're appreciate grateful it. to have you. Mark is from uh, Inglewood, Colorado. Pastor at Calvary Church at Inglewood. Replanted it. Has a network of replant churches. Kyle is running the board for us. Kyle, glad to have you. Got his replant gear on. Looks so good. And we're all here today. We move this podcast around all across North America. We have an RV, and we just travel everywhere, all of us together in a bus. But today we are at the uh, Spurgeon Library at Midwestern. Thank you, Dr. Allen and Midwestern, for letting us use this place. And we are talking about the hidden, below the surface, can't really see them signs of a declining church that you need to be aware of because these are problems for you. And number one, Dan, is what? It's something that I've seen happen in almost every declining church that I've ever served at, and that is they just live too far away. They the commute people. in. Yep. Yeah, they just live farther and farther away. Right. And and I wonder often, how did it get to that point? You know, where? what happened? Did they move away and just decided to keep coming back to the church? Or what happened? But anyway, the point is, the commute will get you. Well, here's the deal. I, I always say all the time, what you want to do is go back. If your church has a pictorial church directory from 25 years ago, every church has a pictorial directory from 25 years ago. Not every church, but most do. Find your church directory. If it's not pictorial, just pull your, your records up. But, but do this. Get your church directory from 20, 25 years ago. Take a map of your community, and, and you can do it online now, You can do it, or you can do it old school, and, and take little dots or pins mm-hmm. and just locate where all the members lived 20, 25 years ago. Then do the very same thing today. And if, if there are noticeably fewer yeah. dots within two miles of your church, if everybody lives further out, that screams that's a problem. Yeah. And you're right, Dan. What's happened is the people who used to live close in – retired, died, moved, you know, or moved away. Mm-hmm. And some of the people who live close in, the neighborhood changed and transitioned, and so they moved out, maybe to be closer to children or grandchildren or closer to work. Or uh, they got a new home, and they, they weren't going to buy a new home in that neighborhood, so they, they moved out and bought a new home somewhere else. And so over time, what used to be a community church becomes a commuter church. Mm-hmm. And when the majority of your people drive in, and the problem with that is you say, wait a minute, wait a minute, Clifton, the church is not a building. You know, the first time I heard that was Thursday. <laughs> I, I, you know, I'm 63 years Never old. Never heard it before. I thought the church was a building. <laughs> it has changed everything about my life. Boy, I'm so glad for the young seminary student on Twitter who pointed that out to me. I will forever be indebted to you, bro. Thank you for your ministry You've on just Twitter. just ruined some kid right now. Thank you for your ministry on Twitter to care for an older saint an like aging me. aging man. I was so off base. We, we're, I know we're the just, church isn't a building, but the, 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 the church is the place we gather. And, and if you live... 12 miles away, and hopefully you're getting to know your neighbors out there, and you're, you're becoming friends with them, and you want to share the gospel with them. 
it's a little hard to ask them to drive 12 miles past 18 churches to get to yours. Mm-hmm. But if your church is in your neighborhood, right? You say, you know that church down there by the school we go by four times a day? That's where I attend. Mm-hmm. We have a Bible study there. We have something there. You're much more able to, to, do, to do that kind of, of evangelism and, and networking when you live in the neighborhood with your church. And one of the things we've lost in North America is the neighborhood That's church. That's right. And yeah. I think one of the most well, – I've been gone from Warner Road in Kansas City now for, for uh, seven or eight, ten, almost ten years. I guess I left in, in 14. They're doing far better now. They've doubled in size since I left. That's my church growth <laughs> method. I leave a church and it doubles. But you need to write a book. The last that. Sunday I was there, we maybe had 120, 130. We had 18 the first Sunday. What I was so thrilled about was that about half or more of those people, if they had to, could have walked to church. Mm. And I might have to walk a couple of miles, but it was it was possible. Yeah. It's a neighborhood church, right? So is your church a neighborhood church or is it a commuter church? That's and you know you don't notice that because you may still have enough people and the ties may still be coming. But man, if they don't live in the neighborhood, yeah. and I was I'm working with the church now, and and then they said, well, yeah, we have some, and so when we talked about it. They had maybe 50 people on Sunday, maybe only 10 lived in the neighborhood. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so right. that, and one of the dangerous parts about that is that if they're not connected to the community, it's going to be hard for them to continue to connect to the church. That's exactly right. So let's talk about uh, um, not only the, the commute, but then there's the issue of worn out ministries. Mm. Things that have just been, we've been doing this for a hundred years right. and we're still doing it. We do it every year, whether we want to do it or not, whether we need to do it or not, yeah. whether it works or not. And Mark, what you were saying before we started the podcast, what are some of the reasons why tr- it's so hard for churches to let go sometimes of these ministries? Well, unfortunately, sometimes members, remember Martha in the Bible? She didn't find her purpose in Jesus' teaching. She found her purpose in serving, yeah. right? That's how she valued her. That's how she found, found her value and her self-worth at that point, at least on that day. Yeah. No, not on that day, because Jesus said, Martha, Martha, you're worried and troubled about many things. And everybody in the room went, yay, <laughs> we get it. No, uh, but, I, but we got people in our churches that rather than finding their joy and purpose and meaning in life in Christ, they find it in doing the work of the church. Mm-hmm. And they talk about it as though they're doing it for Christ. But you know they're not because if you say, you know what, maybe we need to transition and not do this, they freak out and say, wait a minute, that's how I, that's my ministry. That's, that's right. what I yep. do. Yep. I was at a church as a transitional pastor where there was a tradition. This isn't a program, but it was a tradition. It was a program, a music program. We had, we had a, a volunteer choir director who, who wanted to have a special every Sunday. Uh, the problem with that was uh, every Sunday someone sang, it was not special. <laughs> <laughs> Which it, made it special. It was far from special. And they would say, they'd often say, well, the Lord gave me this song today. And by the time they were done, I'd say, I think the Lord would like to have that one back. <laughs> and so I, I just, I'm working with the deacons. We're not going to do any special music for a few months. We're going to read scripture instead. It was, it was, it was awful. Wow. It was yeah. a battle royale hmm. because people found, quote, their ministry was to sing a special. Yeah. No, you're, it wasn't. You're taking their ministry. It was like that. First Baptist got talent, right? Who's got the best? Yeah. My granddaughter's come from out of town. She would like to sing, all that stuff. Yeah. So that's what we're talking about, worn out ministries, things where yeah. it's not glorifying God. It's not reaching people. It's not making this. It all begins with how do we know our church is being successful in a revitalization? Are you a pattern of making disciples that make disciples? that result the community being noticeably better. Now, you're not going to get there overnight, but you have to begin to take away those things you're doing that don't accomplish that Mm -hmm. and add more fire and fuel to those things that do accomplish that. That's right. That's right. And so worn out ministries. What what have you seen worn out ministries in your church? Yeah. I mean, I I think you nailed it. I mean, I, you know, it's interesting. It's, it's classic. I think sometimes we had a, a sweet lady who you know, we didn't have any babies, but she, that was her ministry. You was know, babies? In the church, was holding babies. Holding babies. And, uh, and she, she was never in worship, but she was always ready to hold, hold the babies whenever <laughs> the baby were to come. She was there, all faithful. And I can remember, you know, trying to gently but lovingly say, look, you know, if, 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 we, if any babies show up, right. it'd be great to have you. But until that day comes, right. we'd love for you to be in worship with us. <laughs> and it's like she'd never been heard such a thing. Mm-hmm. And and she was actually really hurt by that mm-hmm. to the point where she stopped coming 
to hold babies mm-hmm. that we didn't have, ironically. Mm-hmm. Um, but but I think I I think of that because what you said, Mark, is so true. I think that can happen in any of our hearts, quite frankly. Boy, is isn't that true? We can find our identity mm. in what we do mm. in in a ministry position mm. rather than in Christ. And and so you know the leadership challenge then of course is how do you lovingly lead people um, from that place of identifying too strongly with their gift whatever that ministry is and help them fall more in love with Jesus mm-hmm. and seeing that as the outflow of what they've been called to and that's pastoral work that's right. shepherding work right. that we need to do as we speak truth in love and it takes time to do that. Right. Let's uh, talk a little bit about the difference between ministries. And volunteering, okay, because there's two different things that are going on. I have people that they fold the bulletin every Sunday, right? For everything, right. that's their ministry. Yeah, it's yeah. not a ministry. No, <laughs> and, you know, and and so they're they're doing their ministry. It's a volunteer. Be, yeah. be, ca- be careful. Be, ca- no, uh, be careful. That's my ministry. <laughs> well, there is a crown in heaven for bullet bulletin <laughs> folders. Folding. Yeah, there is. You get that one. So that's good. Kyle's over here shaking his head like we're in trouble. Dude, we were in trouble. Well, we just, we, we just, were in trouble nine podcasts ago. Well, that that ship has sailed. Well, we just a long stepped on his ago. toes with that last one. That's the problem. I know that's his ministry is folding bulletins, so that's all good. There's another problem that uh, that's just kind of lurking around the corner in most churches that are that are going through a revitalization, and that is the declining ministry funds for children and students. That's right. So if you want to see if your church yeah is indeed at risk for closure or for decline. I agree. How far do people commute? Do you have a bunch of worn-out ministries that aren't making any difference? And when you look at your your budget, look at what you spent on children and youth ministry a decade ago Mm -hmm. and what you spend on children and youth ministry today. And maybe factor in inflation if you need to do that, but probably... Yeah. You won't even have to do that. You'll right. probably it'll stop, probably still be less. And why but, Why is that? I mean, the, the attitude is, well, they're not around anymore. They're not. So, that's it. Right? You hit it. I mean, yeah. we can shut this thing down right now, this podcast. It's yeah. over. Yeah. That's it. It's not <laughs> yeah. that we're putting money in there to reach them. Yep. Well, there's no one there, so we don't fund it. That's exactly right. And it right. goes down every year, and you fund it less and less. Look, I you can go to a church and say, let me see your budget. And if, if there's almost nothing for preschool, nothing for children, nothing for youth, and then you say— why is there are there no funds? And they say that well, yeah. we don't have any. And you just want to go. Your head wants to explode. Yeah. You go well. That's sure a way to get them. I yeah. mean, yeah, it's, yeah, that's right. that's not right. to put any resources toward yeah. reaching them. Pretty smart to me. Yeah. Let me yeah. write that yeah. down yeah. and put it in yeah. a book. Yeah. That's yeah. pretty yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah. That'll work. You know, it's this is part of visionary leadership. You you've got to lead. If you're leading revitalization, you have to lead in a way that even if like with kids, let's take kids as an example. The kids aren't there yet. But you have to lead in a way and help your people begin to function as though they are there. So, for instance, example, um, we had uh, when we began to see just a handful of little of little kids coming, a few young families. One of the things that I said, hey, we've got to have a check in, a, a children's check in area um, that looks good. You know, again, we didn't have much money, but it looks good. We need to figure out a system for uh, to put you know tags on the kiddos so the parents feel safe dropping their kids off and all these things and. I can remember a couple of the older folks going, are you nuts? We don't, why, why in the world do we need that? And I said, listen, if we're going to reach families, that's the first thing they're looking at is, do, I, do you guys have your act together? Can, you, can I trust my child with you? And so I can remember we built a, te- a check-in team, even though we had like four kids. But what I can tell you is part of the growth that we began to see in families was when families came, they said, man, this church actually really cares about my kids. Mm. And, and uh, they've taken the step to do it. So don't expect families to come back if you're not, if you're not putting forth the effort, the resources, whatever it takes uh, to say, we love kids, we value them, we value your family, and, uh, and we want to do the best we can with what we have um, I'm not saying you got to have some check-in system like the megachurch down down the street, but you better have something that communicates we love you and we take this seriously. Your church does something that I find. It, I mean, I know other churches do it, but and his church is Eaglewood. It's um, Calvary Church at Eaglewood, I'm Colorado. Sorry, I, sh- I should have mentioned. By that. the way, I got. I'm the only one of us here wearing headphones in this podcast. I'm just. By the way, we 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 <laughs> well, produced the, the, <laughs> we produced this pod. We 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 don't have any production. Quality. We just, I always uh, see you with headphones on. I just well, figured that I was, was the <laughs> guy walks down the, <laughs> walks out on the out sidewalk with yeah. headphones so on. You, know? I, you guys, your voices sound so rich and so deep, and I sound like I'm in like 
a barrel. Oh no, is this I'm with okay? you. No, it's D- Dan's mm-hmm. voice is gorgeous. I mean, well, he's I know got that. a professional. I know voice. that. Well, you sound great. No, you sound great. Do I sound okay. Oh, yeah. I got real, a weird I'm, voice. I'm I've really got a weird voice. Secure about that. I've yeah, got a great surgeon that can can you? help you out. Can you? <laughs> okay, we can figure something out on that regard. Oh, right. he was. But Dan was we, saying something. We, we, we have lost something. our audience now. Yeah. All something eight about them. a church. Our yep. church does something. Your church does something with kids. You you put together a little packet, so that when a family shows up, they've got a packet for the kids for the worship service. Yeah. Tell me about it, because that that means you've allotted some funds along that right. line. Right. It's, it's simple things like that, Dan, that I think, you know, what does that communicate? One, for us, it communicates the value that we want children in the worship gathering. <laughs> We're our, our conviction is we don't want kids to to be separate from the adults all the time. We want to help them uh, see the joy and grow up as worshipers. So in those packets, we also recognize, man, this is a five-year-old kid. You know what I mean? And so how can we help them engage uh, with what we're doing? So what's in that packet is not just some toys to just play around with, but even from a young age, we're trying to help them see, even if there's one or two points from the from the service that that the, uh, from the sermon that they learned about or something that God did in their life in that day, we want to train them up. And we're tr- we are called to train up the next generation of disciples. And so how are we helping uh, families equip these kids? You've got to have a vision for it, man. You've got to, if you don't have a vision for what you're going to do with the kids once they come, don't expect them to ever come. I mean, that's just the truth. And what are you going to do with it? But it's interactive. It is interactive. Right. It is interactive. I mean, I think, again, you've got to think about the language of children. I think Mm -hmm. this is the whole topic of children's ministry. How do kids learn? How do they feel engaged? And trying to get to their level and say, hey, how can they feel like they're part of this revitalization, too? Does that make sense? Yeah. And we need to do a whole podcast on when you don't have any kids in your church, what do you do? Yep. Well, one of the things you can do right now is... Clean out all the old junk in the preschool room. Because yeah. if you don't have any children in your church, I guarantee you your preschool room looks pretty bad. And it probably smells weird. You know, one time I was uh, a <laughs> yeah. – I know everybody's thinking, how many stories does this old man have? Dude, I got a lot He's of stories. He's just getting started. I'm man. just getting started. <laughs> so I was, at, I was at a church not far from your house, buddy. You know, you know what I'm talking about. And um, they had about 10 or 12 people left, and they were going to interview a young seminary student and his wife to be their pastor. So I met with him that that Wednesday night in the church basement, and this seminary student had this sweet you know, little girl. Her name was Annabelle. She was so sweet, and she's about three or four years old, about four, actually. And so Annabelle and her mom were there. And so we're, we're having this discussion, and one of the older ladies tells the pastor's wife, a potential pastor's wife, said, you know, we have a nursery down the hall if you want to take Annabelle down there and look at some toys. And okay. So mom and Annabelle went down there, and mom told me when they opened the nursery door, Annabelle said, is this a garage sale? Because <laughs> because she'd been going to garage sales with her mother, and the nursery room looked like a bunch of old toys and stuff to Annabelle. And she wasn't making a joke. Yeah. Annabelle wasn't kidding. Yeah. She's right. only four, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Dude, if your children's area looks like a garage sale, clean it up. Look, if, take some money. Get rid of go Call one of the larger churches yep. in your association. Yep. That has a children's ministry. Yes. And say, would you mind, could we make an appointment with your children's director to come over to our church, walk through our children's area, tell us what we need to get rid of, what we need to keep, and give us a list of things we need to have. You say, we don't have any kids. I know, but now's the time to get your children's ready, That's right. room ready. No. So if a visitor shows up, the parents are going to look, look at all this great stuff, all this clean stuff. Do it now. Well, oh, let yeah. me say this, too. And if you're listening to this and you're part of a healthy church or maybe a larger church yep. that could come alongside and partner with with a struggling church and, man, redo their children's wing, man. Yeah. Redo their children. Put You've got money. You've got right. resources. Right. Don't tell me you don't. Right. You need to give that stuff away. And you could come and bless a congregation. You know what? If you've got a, a women's min- if you oh, got a, man. If you've got a larger, healthier church and you've got a good women's ministry, you know, go to a dying, declining church that needs some help in their children's mm-hmm. work. And, and, and come up with a list and have that women's ministry do a baby shower for the nursery. That's wow. a great idea. For the idea. new nursery. That's a have great idea. Because you get the nursery Love ready it. before the baby comes. Absolutely. That's right. That's right. Absolutely. That's really All right. So well, where are we? I'm completely lost. Well, let's go. We've talked about the, the those those little unseen things, the commute and the worn out ministries and the declining ministry funds for, for children's and student ministries. Oh, yeah, right. But here's, here's, a, here's one that uh, happens all the time, and that is, and we, we're kind of poking fun at this, but let's face it, it is. It's a pastoral parade. Oh, yeah. You know? I mean, 
<laughs> they come and they go. And I keep looking for the clowns, you know, <laughs> where the floats are. You know, it's, come on. <laughs> yeah, when I went to Warnell Road in Kansas City, they had this big, long hallway you walked in when you came in the church. They'd remodel the church, put the parking lot at the back, which wasn't there originally. So you came in the back, and they made this little, almost like a tunnel, like you were going, like you were in a, 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 a gymnasium and you're walking out to the to the to the stadium yeah. so there's this long you had to walk down this tunnel the guys who people go to Warnell know what I'm talking about you walk down this tunnel to get to the church and so what they'd done on the on in this probably 20 25 foot long hallway they had pictures of every single pastor the mm-hmm. church had had mm-hmm. with the date of their arrival and their departure and of course most of them were black and white most of them had been dead for a long time all of them were white men right yeah and almost none of them were smiling. And so that's what, you know, the <laughs> eyes would follow you as you would walk in. And you go, how many pastors has this church had? And, of course, your eyes were always drawn to the guy who stayed, who came in 1983 and left in 1983. Yeah. There's a backstory yeah. there. You know, <laughs> it's the Millard Fillmore of pastors, you know. <laughs> and so uh, what this means is, though, yeah. when there's a parade of pastors, what happens is someone who's not called to be a pastor actually functions in that role. Mm-hmm. And, you know, by the way, a lot of these things, like most of the things we do in this podcast, really is an influence from Tom Rayner and the six years I had with him on Revitalize and Replant back in those years, and he really helped me a lot. So a lot of this information comes from Dr. Rayner, and I'm grateful for that. But one of the things Dr. Rayner has discovered is that in a lot of churches, smaller churches that have a parade of pastors, they stay a year to three years, maybe four at the most, then they're gone. Then what? There's six or eight, nine months between pastors. He said he's seen some churches where the church secretary really becomes the pastor. Oh, wow. Now, it doesn't mean she preaches. It yeah. doesn't mean she gives spiritual leadership, but she's she's the Doing one. Doing everything that, else. She She's the one that knows everything for 20 years. Yeah, she's got right. all the corporate memory, yep. and, and she's, you know, and, and so people who— and, it's such it, it can be we always say if you're not willing to stay five years don't go mm, mm-hmm. this is a this is a generalization but if you go to church and need a revitalization and you stay a couple of years and leave chances are you're going to do more damage than good mm. because whoever forced you to leave is going to be empowered because they forced you to leave yeah uh, now, there are times that God wants to do something in your life and their life, and 18 months is all he wants you there. But those are the rare exceptions, not the rule. Well, and I think, too, you know, in the, I think we're titling this Unseen Signs of a Declining Church. The flip side of that is I've seen churches that actually don't want pastors around a long time. Okay. Can almost begin to feel uh, threatened or, you know, this, especially if you've got folks who have power. It's a sick thing. But part of what you've got to do is help churches see you need a pastor who's going to be faithful and be here a long time. Mm -hmm. Like this is what's best, not only for you, but for this community. So that means you can't be running guys out left and right either. You know, so it goes both ways. Well, that's true. Running them out really does keep the other people, the the shadow government in place. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. One more thing. We've got to wrap it up. We're almost out of time here. But one more thing about those unseen signs of declining or dying churches and that is the facility itself. Yes. <clears throat> Again, an old uh, Methodist uh, church consultant used to play a game when a church would call him. His name was Lyle Schaller. They'd say, would you come and do a church consult with us? The first thing Lyle Schaller would do, he'd walk in the sanctuary and he would play the game, what year is it? You know, <laughs> And he, in his mind, he would look around and he goes, the last time you decorated this was, and he would think, he'd go, 1977? And they go, 1975. Close. <laughs> so that's what I do. That's how I get my, my kicks now in church revitalization. That's, I go to a church and, and I play this game. What year is it? Because oh, you haven't touched this place in, is it, you know, you can tell by the light fixtures, the color schemes, right? Whether it's red or mauve or blue or green, you know, what year is it? And, and basically what that is saying is that we haven't touched anything in this mm. place. And look, the building doesn't save anybody. The building doesn't change heart. I get all of that, but you it's a tool. Here's the deal, and we'll end with this. We want to remove every barrier between a lost person and Jesus except the cross. And you get a lost person whose life is all, and you may want to share this with some of your building team, your trustees, if you've got them at your church, and say, you need to listen to what this guy's saying, and then I'll say it instead of you. You want to remove every barrier except the cross. You've got some people in your community who are dealing with drugs, with addiction, with divorce, with terminal cancer, with children who are who are reprobate and, and 
all kinds of problems in their life, and, and for whatever reason, they, 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 they do decide that they're going to visit your, your church, your worship service, and somebody invites them. And they walk in, and the first thing they see is something that looks like it's 40 years out of date. And they're going to think, do these people really understand my life? Do they even know what I'm going yeah, through? Yeah, that's right. But if they walk into a place and it looks like someplace they just left, they're, they're, they're going to feel like, okay, I, there's something new happening here. I think mm-hmm. maybe they can understand. It, it just removes one unnecessary barrier. And so that's what I'm saying. And also it helps people get used. The less you change things, the less they want to change them. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, the more you can change them up sometimes, just to change them up is good. But nonetheless, your building, what, what year is it? And don't let your facility become a barrier. That's good. You've been listening to Revitalize and Replant with Mark Clifton, uh, which is sponsored by the North American Mission Board, which we thank them very much for this. And uh, we'd love for you to be an active part of our of our ministry here. Uh, if you would subscribe to it, that lets us know that you're listening, but it also helps us to market. The more people that we have subscribing, we're able to market uh, this. And of course, it's free. Um, but there's, it still requires some marketing and, and responsibilities along that line. So we want to be good stewards of that, and we would appreciate it if you would subscribe and leave your comments and questions uh, and uh, let us know what you think. And we hope that you'll join us again for the next episode of Revitalize and Replant with Mark Clifton. Thanks for joining us today on Revitalize and Replant. This podcast is brought to you by the North American Mission Board where we help dying or struggling churches regain health for the glory of God and the good of their communities. If you found this conversation helpful, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite platform. To learn more about becoming a replanting pastor or to explore resources about revitalization for your own church, visit churchreplanters.com.